So um, today's lecture. I should also point out that uh, the, the last bit of the last lecture, which I guess we all missed because I didn't get to it about the residence times, I uh, just found out that the video of that was a little bit corrupted. So I'll do that again. Um, so do watch that because it is relevant. Um, anyway, so today we're, and tomorrow we're going to be talking about the carbon cycle. So trying to explain some of the, the variability that we saw in that video. Okay. Um, it's important, so it gets two lectures. Uh, so we're going to be talking about kind of what are the geological history of it, and we kind of covered that a little bit in the climate series. Um, and then, importantly, we're going to be talking about uh, these reservoirs of carbon. So basically, boxes that we can kind of like imagine that the Earth is kind of split up into boxes. Each box has a different amount of carbon in it. Each box will have a different residence time. So the exchange of carbon in and out of that box will be different for the different reservoirs. Okay? And we'll go, go through that. Um, and we'll go through um, some of these global inventories to see kind of where the carbon is stored. Um, so which, which processes are more important and less important for determining changes in the atmospheric comp composition. OK, so just to kind of the recap. So this is the last kind of maybe 10,000 years of um, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. So uh, these are measured from um, ice cores. OK, and you can see over the last 10,000 years, there's been this kind of steady increase in CO2 of maybe you know, 20 or so parts per million. Okay. Um, it's actually quite controversial what's causing the rise from here to here. Okay, so there is one hypothesis that this is actually anthropogenic in that this is when we started developing farming, changing land use, chopping down loads of trees, replacing it with kind of like farmland. Um, but that's not, uh, that's not necessarily true. So there's another kind of like school of thought where this is in fact uh, a natural increase uh, where the Earth system is still adjusting from the last glacial maximum. Okay? And if you, uh, if you put on the last glacial maximum, so this is kind of last glacial maximum, this is when kind of Scotland and, and Northern Ireland and um, Northern England was covered in ice. Uh, all of North America, well, lots of North America was covered in ice. So a, a drastically different world that we're looking at. And um, you can see that uh, CO2 was much lower then. Um, and has been rising up during the deglaciation. So this is when all of the ice sheets kind of disappeared. Most of the ice sheets were gone at this point here about 10,000 years ago. And then this period here is called the Holocene, kind of sometimes referred to as the recent um, incorrectly. Um, but you can see here that this, this grey bar represents the kind of the natural range of CO2 that we've been experiencing over the last maybe almost million years or so. Uh, and this is uh, basically the Industrial Revolution here, increasing CO2. And these are the so we're probably we're up here now, just under 400 parts per million. So you can see that the, the anthropogenic perturbation is of the same magnitude as the variation that we've been having over the last, you know, since ever. Um, but importantly, you can see that the rate of change is much steeper in the modern than it is um, for in the past. Even some of these rapid changes when we're having kind of huge environmental changes that, during the deglaciation, rapid sea level rise, melting of ice sheets, huge changes of ecosystems, uh, none of that compares to the rate that we're having at the moment. And this just to put that in that, that long-term context, so uh, just, to, just to give you a heads up, like good geologists, we flip the axis around, so age is now going old to young. Um, and this is the CO2 record, as measured from ice cores, and it's kind of bouncing up and down between kind of minus, between minus, no, I have minus concentrations, between 180 and kind of 280 parts per million uh, in the atmosphere. And then now we've just shot up to up here. And this is the kind of the, a temperature proxy record uh, to show that you know these CO2 variability, this CO2 kind of shenanigans has implications for kind of the temperature of the planet. So it's important to understand not only kind of the modern rise in CO2, but also some of these natural rises in CO2 in the past. Okay, because if we can understand these and how CO2 has moved or carbon has moved from the atmosphere.
some of these other reservoirs, maybe the ocean, maybe into rocks, maybe into the biosphere. Okay, so we can understand some of those transfer processes. Okay, that's useful knowledge for us understanding how the Earth system works and how we can kind of like understand our modern environment, which is important because we live in the modern environment. Okay, so going back even further into time, so once again, I flip the axis around. So now this is the young and this is the old, just to keep you on your toes, um, and also because I downloaded it off the internet and couldn't flip it around. Um, but you can see here that the concentrations of CO2, these are all proxy measurements now, so these are not direct measurements from ice cores, so we're not actually measuring the fossil atmosphere. So these are proxy measurements. Uh, usually, I think some of these are measured, I think boron isotopes, which you know, actually you don't need to know that, or um, fossil leaves can tell you about uh, past, climate uh, past carbon dioxide concentrations. But what we can see here is that actually in the geological past, if you go really, really old, Okay, you do have periods where we may well have had CO2 concentrations that were much, much higher than present. Okay? Um, and this is kind of important because these, I mean, this was a habitable, uh, habit, habitable, habit, a habitable planet. Okay, stuff was living here. Okay, and this is kind of like dinosaur time. And this is kind of like uh, evolution of kind of like macro fauna, fauna animals um, during the Cambrian explosion. Kind of on this, but this is um, so animals were like pretty happy. There are lots of plants going at these times, but it would have been a very, very different world to be living in these times up here. Okay, so we would have had, you know, um, it would be much hotter, much more stormy and unpleasant, um, and there'd have been dinosaurs, which would have been kind of awesome, but um, slightly dangerous. Um, but if we want to understand some of these climates in the past, okay, if we want to understand what were the climate drivers that, that maybe changed the environments that helped kind of dinosaurs change into birds, all kinds of fun stuff, um, we need to understand the carbon cycle. We need to understand how we can actually get maybe an atmosphere that has got a, maybe 10 times more CO2 than it does at the present, okay, and how it sustains that carbon in the atmosphere, okay, and how that carbon doesn't come out and go back into some of the other reservoirs. Okay, so it's, it's important, basically, understanding the history of everything on Earth, understanding the carbon cycle. Okay, so uh, I've already said this, but yeah. So just to, just to reiterate that, although it's 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 nice to be able to go back to these times in the past and use them, say, well, you know, in the past we can maybe use past higher concentrations of CO two as an analog for understanding maybe the future climate. Okay, so if we look at maybe back to um, 55 million years ago during a period called the Eemian. It was kind of a lot warmer than present. This was kind of when mammals were kind of like kind of radiating and evolving kind of like crazy. Um, and this, was, this is kind of sometimes used as, if we can understand the time then, we can maybe understand what the climate's gonna be like uh, in the future when kind of, because the CO2 is gonna carry on going up. But the key difference is that the rates of change are going to be very different. Okay, so we're not necessarily going to be in what we would call a steady state, where all of the fluxes in and out of our reservoirs are going to be in balance. Okay, so we're potentially going to be looking at a much more dynamic um, situation where, where where carbon is moving from one reservoir and back and forth into another. Okay, so to understand the carbon cycle, we need to kind of first of all describe describe it so we need to know where the carbon is in each of our boxes in the carbon cycle okay so where they are uh, what form of carbon they're in so uh, are they gaseous carbon are they solid carbon and importantly what are the fluxes between each of these boxes okay and then we can also look at how we've stuffed it up so this is kind of a, a really important <laughs> figure so this is I think from the the IPCC report um, not the most recent one but the one before that but um, I mean, they, they basically used the same figure again and updated it. But this is a really good kind of graphical illustration of the whole carbon cycle. Uh, and it's quite nice in that we talk about these different reservoirs of places that you can store carbon in the carbon cycle as boxes, and they've actually drawn them as boxes, okay, which is quite nice. So some carbon is in the atmosphere as CO2. Okay, some carbon is in fossil fuels as kind of elemental carbon um, in coal, mostly. Um, some carbon is as organic matter in the biosphere, okay, so there's kind of like a, 
uh, biosphere box. Um, some carbon is dissolved in the ocean. Okay, and we'll go on to the, the next lecture to, to, to what form of carbon that's in. So it's not in carbon, well, some of it's in carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean, but then it does other kind of chemistry things, which is exciting. Um, and then some carbon is in kind of marine life. Okay, so this is quite an important box. It turns out that, you know, things like, you know, us, you know, destroying all of the whales, okay, um, that apparently had quite a big impact on the, 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 this, the size of this box here, because whales are really big. And there, and there were a lot of them. So it was by removing the macrofauna from the ocean, that's had an impact on carbon storage in the ocean. Okay, small, but, but you know, significant. And also because you kind of like whales, right? Kind of cute. Um, there's a, you can split the ocean into a shallow box and a deep box, and I kind of explained that in the last lecture with this kind of like shallow buoyant layer and the kind of the deeper colder layer. And then we have a final box, which is kind of sediments, okay? And we could, in fact, split this into kind of surface sediment, so the, sed the layer of sediment that can interact with the ocean and kind of the rock, and kind of deep sediments that are buried away in kind of the deep earth. Okay? Now, it doesn't really matter if we split those into rocks. The stuff that's buried in the deep earth is, um, you know, it doesn't really interact with uh, the environment so readily. Um, it interacts through the weathering cycle, okay? So, um, although there is an enormous amount of carbon in the deep earth, stored in, in rocks, in things like carbonate rocks, um, and stored as kind of uh, CO2 in kind of trapped in volcanic rocks, um, the fluxes out of that are very small, okay, compared to some of the fluxes between these other boxes. So we saw in that video that we could see even the day-night flux between the biosphere and the atmosphere, okay? And that was these fluxes here, so this uh, primary productivity, so I think in the previous section we called that NPP, but now gross primary productivity coming down and respiration going up. Okay, so these are huge fluxes, so these gigatons of carbon per year, okay, compared to the flux from weathering, okay? So these can these can have very very big short term effects on the on the on the climate on the on the on the on the concentration of carbon in, e in each of the boxes. Sorry, which then has an impact on climate. Um, and you can see the same for the ocean. So there's a huge flux of carbon into the ocean and a huge flux of carbon out of the ocean. Okay, but the, the sizes of the, the boxes are quite small. So although the fluxes are big, if we kept that flux going, if we had an imbalance here. Say, for instance, between if we kind of halve respiration, okay, or we, we halve primary productivity, the, bo the, the boxes would become depleted very, very quickly, okay? Okay, so if we so imagine we halved this photosynthesis flux down into plants, okay, that means we would, we would, if we kept that one constant, the size of this box would get smaller and smaller and smaller, okay, um, which means that then the flux out of the box would also start to reduce. So although these fluxes are very big, imbalances in them, if we, if we start to, to change them, they won't last very long. So they can't have a very long-term impact on the climate. So they, they can't drive climate change over millions of years. Whereas some of these fluxes out of, uh, for instance, the weathering flux, it's a very, very small flux. It's a tiny amount of, of carbon per year compared to all of the other fluxes but it can go on for almost forever because you'll never deplete rocks from, with carbon. Okay? So that's a, a kind of a, a subtle, um, important thing. Uh, and the other thing on this figure is it also shows these red arrows, which are where we've changed stuff. Okay, so we have, uh, we've added this whole new box, okay, which is burning fossil fuels, which you can kind of think of as increasing the flux from, from the deep earth. From, from biosphere. So, um, so this is, is adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and you'll notice that this doesn't have a return arrow. Okay? So whereas, whereas these large fluxes of carbon into the ocean from the atmosphere and into the biosphere from the atmosphere, they're much, much bigger than our fossil fuel burning flux, but they, um, they, they have a return arrow. So they're, they're counteracted by kind of um, you know, diffusion back into the ocean, diffusion out of the ocean, 
primary productivity and respiration. They kind of almost balance each other. So these anthropogenic fluxes basically don't have this return error. So that means that they are driving the atmosphere to have more carbon in it. Okay. So that's kind of important. Okay, so to kind of like to summarize like the magnitude of, of, of those 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 boxes, so the atmosphere has actually got a relatively small amount of carbon in it. Okay, so this is in uh, uh, billion tons of carbon, I think, which is which is gigatons. Yes, gigatons of carbon. Um, yes, it says up there. Oh, idiot. Right. So um, it has these it has quite small compared to some of the other boxes. So bland plants similar to the atmosphere, but actually soils, although not so sexy, uh, soils are really important because there's a lot of organic matter held within soils. Okay, and that organic matter uh, has got a slightly longer residence time than the plants. So you could see the residence time of carbon in the plants is actually quite short. You could almost see it in a day-night cycle changing. Okay, whereas the residence time in soils is considerably longer. Maybe, maybe tens to hundreds of years it takes to deplete or replenish uh, carbon in soils. Um, but the really important thing is these other boxes, and particularly the ocean. Okay, there is so much more carbon in the ocean than in the atmosphere. Okay, uh, and this is really important because that means that the, the it takes a long time to change the concentration of carbon in the ocean. Okay, and there are quite, you saw from the figure before, there are quite large fluxes between the ocean and the atmosphere. Okay, and we'll go on to see what those fluxes are maybe later today or tomorrow. But this means that when we add carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're not really adding it to the atmosphere. We're adding it to the atmosphere and the ocean. Okay, and that means that it has a much bigger capacity to absorb all of the carbon we're emitting out. Okay? So it turns out that, that most of the carbon that we have put into the atmosphere, quite a lot of that has gone into the ocean, okay? which is good because it means that it's not in the atmosphere, it's not having so much of a climatic impact. Okay? Uh, and we'll see tomorrow uh, how the different chemistry of the ocean can help determine how much carbon you can store in the ocean. Okay? So it's not just a direct proportionality between the concentration in the atmosphere and the concentration in the ocean, the ocean chemistry of carbon matters. So the, 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 the portions you have of dissolved carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, and carbonate ions really, really matter. Okay? Um, and then we've got sedimentary rocks, which is a huge, huge store of carbon, but the fluxes in and out of that are very slow. So not so important for human timescales, but for long geological timescales, understanding the fluxes in and out of sedimentary rocks is really important. Okay, so quickly now, just going over some of these, uh, these fluxes, so we can see that we've got this huge store in the ocean, less in the atmosphere, plants and soils. Okay, and some of these fluxes in and out, so we've got this photosynthesis flux and then respiration of plants and heterotrophic respiration is essentially the respiration caused by the breakdown of organic matter, either by bacteria, fungi or animals. Okay, so this is basically stuff that is eating plants. Okay, so th these kind of fluxes are almost in balance. Okay, we've, we've kind of had a small uh, change here with deforestation. So we are changing kind of the, the flux in between the, basically the biosphere and the atmosphere by, you can think of this as land use changes. If you, if you take kind of a nice rainforest, okay, and convert that into pasture for cattle, which we kind of do because you know, burgers are tasty. Um, that, that, that ranch land, that pasture, can't, has less carbon in it because right, grass has got less carbon in than trees. Okay? Also, the soils of grasses have less carbon in than the soils in a rainforest. Okay? So that's led to a net flux out. So kind of every year we're, giving, we're, we're deforesting one and a half billion tons of, of carbon, which is dumb, but, you know, burgers are terrible. Um, so we can look again at some of the res residence times of these, um, uh, these, uh, these things. So we can look at the, the residence time of carbon in the biosphere. So 
the, the plants or the biomass carbon stored in plants can respond quite quickly to changes in these fluxes. Okay. Uh, soils take a little bit longer. Uh, rainforests, again, are very, very stable. It takes a long time to change the stock of carbon in a rainforest unless you're kind of like slashing and burning it. Okay. So these things respond quite slowly, well, reasonably fast and then quite slowly to changes in, in fluxes. Okay. So we can look at the effects of some of these changes in fluxes through time. So this is the record of atmospheric CO2 from Mauna Loa, which may be familiar to some of you that have done my practical. And also in grey, we've got the same kind of series of measurements, but made uh, at the South Pole in Antarctica. Okay? And you can see that there's this long-term rise, okay? and that's kind of our long-term anthropogenic inputs into the atmosphere. But you can see this seasonal cycle. Okay? And that's a seasonal cycle because in the summer, okay, lots of photosynthesis happens, and that draws down carbon out of the atmosphere. Okay? And in the winter, you have more respiration. So this is an annual cycle. And uh, you can see it's changing because the residence time of the, the, the store of carbon in the biosphere is quite short. So it can exchange its kind of fluxes quite quickly with the atmosphere. Now, you can see the changes here uh, in the southern hemisphere are of a smaller magnitude than the changes in the northern hemisphere. And they're completely out of phase. Okay? So when you've got high in the southern hemisphere, you've got low in the, the northern hemisphere. And that's because when it's summer in the northern hemisphere, it's winter in the southern hemisphere, which is kind of ridiculously obvious. Um, but the magnitude is smaller. Because if you look at a map of the Earth, there's a map of the Earth over there, you can see that there's more land in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere. So there's more terrestrial biosphere to respond seasonally. Okay? So there's bigger changes in the, the total balance between respiration and, and, and photosynthesis in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere. Okay? That's why the magnitude of these signals is, are different. Okay, so you can also look at balance that with, you know, we would predict if there was a balance changing photosynthesis, so photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and water and produces organic matter and oxygen, okay, you can take those and you would predict that there would be a change in oxygen, okay, and you can see that here, so the oxygen follows a similar pattern, so oxygen is going down when CO2 is going up, and it has this same kind of sawtooth pattern, Okay, and the magnitude is bigger in the northern hemisphere, in red, than it is in the southern hemisphere. Okay, so I put this graph up, and also I just refer to the practical on uh, the Excel practical I've been doing. So I showed you one graph, and then I've showed you another graph, and I've told you to compare the two. Okay, that's not a really good way of presenting the data, is it? It would be much better if I if I'd have showed you two one graph with the both plotted together. Okay. So when you're trying to make a point, like I'm trying to make a point to you right now, think carefully about how you're presenting the data. So it would have been much better if I'd have presented them at least on the same slide. Okay. But I could have made a plot that had uh, the carbon uh, dioxide and then plotted underneath that. We could have had the, the oxygen okay, plotted on the same scale. And I've kind of stretched this out because I don't actually have these data. Um, again, I've stolen off the internet. Um, but you can kind of see really clearly now that one's going up, the other's going down, okay? And the northern hemisphere, uh, well, in, in each hemisphere, so you can see that the, the, so the northern hemisphere is the red, so when that's high, CO2 is, uh, is low, okay? So they, it fits our expectations of this being a photosynthesis-driven kind of variability, okay? Okay, so that's kind of, you know, summarises kind of what I've said, that we have CO2 reduced in the summer and higher in the winter because of the misbalance between photosynthesis and rep respiration. Okay, and we have this difference in the, between the north and south because of the difference distribution of land masses. 
Okay, so um, this is just kind of like a lot of stuff which kind of summarizes kind of the stocks of, 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 of where the carbon is. So I'm not going to go through that. You can kind of go through that in your own time or later. But there's stuff that you might want to know in there. Um, so just looking at perturbations of that, okay, we've put this extra flux of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, this extra flux of, um, of carbon from land use change, okay? Okay, uh, and we can then kind of, you know, summarize that. So we've, we've, we've added seven and a half gigatons per year. We're adding seven and a half gigatons per year from fossil fuel burning and uh, one and a half gigatons from land use changes. You add those up, okay? So we're putting those in the atmosphere, okay? So we should see the atmosphere go up by nine gigatons of carbon every year because we're putting that in the atmosphere, okay? Um, however, okay, so that should, should roughly equate to increasing the atmospheric concentration by 1.2% every year, okay, which is quite a lot. Um, so it actually is a lot less than that, okay? So if we actually look at what's going up, we're actually adding only 4.2 gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere. So of the nine that we're burning, or, well, we're burning, we're burning but you can, it's basically burning. You're either burning coal or oil or trees, okay? That's what these are, coal and oil, trees, okay? Should be nine, is 4.2, okay? So where's all that um, so if we increase the atmosphere, atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, okay, we're going to increase the concentration gradients between the atmosphere and the ocean. Okay, so more stuff is going to want to dissolve in the ocean. Okay, so that's a thing that's happening. Okay, so we've actually increased the flux into the ocean by uh, 2.3 gigatons of carbon. So we've now got a, a mismatch between those two. Um, and we've also, so that still doesn't, that still doesn't equal nine, right? That's kind of 6.5, okay? So it also turns out that um, we've got, this is what we've added. That's what's gone, the atmosphere is increasing by 4.2. The ocean is uptaking 2.3, okay? Now, we haven't actually got a very good measurement of what's happening on the land, okay? But just by the difference, the only other place that the carbon that we've put in the atmosphere can go is actually into the terrestrial biosphere, okay? Which is kind of a little bit counterintuitive because we know that we're chopping it down and burning it like mad, right? But even though we're chopping it down um, to make tasty, tasty burgers, um, the total amount of carbon stored in the terrestrial biosphere has gone up, okay? And the reason for this is because the terrestrial biosphere has a really short residence time, okay? So it can respond quite quickly to changes in the input and output fluxes, okay? Uh, so and this is just another, another way of looking at some of the, these, these fluxes. Um, so over time, the amount that we've kind of burnt fossil fuels are this grey stuff here. This is different types of deforestation. So this is adding, basically, these are uh, fluxes out Okay, and then we've got the ocean is taking up some amounts of carbon. Okay, we know how much has gone into the atmosphere. Okay, so this is kind of plotted as the atmosphere is taking carbon out of the system, but we just it's just a, a way of kind of plotting it such that the uh, the increase in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere is taken as kind of a net flux out of the whole system. It's just an accounting trick. Um, so this, this, this bit in the middle that we basically are just adding up by difference, okay? So this is how much is going into the, the, the land, how much is going to terrestrial biosphere. I should point out that this is the flux per year, okay? So this is not the total amount, this is just the, the, the changing flux. And this is why this is so kind of crazy and noisy, because the flux does go up and down each year with kind of weather. Okay, so we, can we, do we have any evidence for the terrestrial biosphere actually responding to this increase in carbon dioxide concentration. So one thing we could look at is the amplitude of this cycle. 
Okay, so this is kind of the difference between respiration and um, photosynthesis. Okay, so we can measure maybe the, the, the amplitude of the, the seasonal cycle here and the amplitude of the seasonal cycle kind of up here. And if the terrestrial biosphere is being more active, okay, if it's photosynthesizing more and then respir respirizing, respir respiring, respiring more in the, in the winter, you'd expect this amplitude to get bigger. Okay? Imagine if, if, if the terrestrial biosphere kind of shut down and was really sluggish and really inefficient. There would be no seasonal cycle. Okay? So the more active the biosphere, the bigger this seasonal cycle. No, oh, that's not what I want. Okay, so we can actually plot up the magnitude of that seasonal cycle through time. Okay? And we can see that it's increasing. Okay? So that suggests to us that the biosphere is becoming more and more active through time. Okay? Um, so just as a little aside, I looked at these data here and I thought, actually, I don't believe it's changed that much. Okay? Because in the plot before, you couldn't really see a difference in the magnitude of one cycle to the other. So I actually took the data from the practical and plotted up myself. Okay? And it looks a bit different, so I don't know how they made that plot before, but some <coughs> shenanigans went on. But you can see now I've plotted the seasonal cycle. This is the, the difference in CO2 between winter and summer in every year. And you can see it's quite noisy, lots of noise going up and down here. And that's because you know, one year might be a little bit more different to another because of weather. But you can see that there is an overall trend to higher values. And it's not really very convincing, is it? Okay. But I have done some statistics on this uh, using the medium of Excel and statistics and kind of maths and stuff. And it turns out that this best fit line here, there's a 97% likelihood that that is greater than a flat line. So there's a very small chance that it's not, that it's just straight across, no difference. Okay? But it is increasing through time. So the seasonal cycle does appear to be getting bigger. The biosphere is becoming more and more active. And the reason for that is this, this thing called CO2 fertilization. Okay? So because plants need carbon dioxide, okay, it actually turns out that carbon dioxide is one of the things that actually limits plant growth. Okay? So if you're a Californian tomato manufacturer, like Howlings, okay, if you have your greenhouses and you pump carbon dioxide into them, which they do, you produce much more tomatoes. Okay? Um, this is kind of this is done kind of in lots of places in the industrial world, uh, partially sometimes to mitigate kind of CO two from power stations. But if you uh, if you if you increase the concentration of carbon dioxide, you massively increase the efficiency of photosynthesis. Okay. You also increase the water use efficiency, but that's kind of a totally different story. Um, but it, it basically, and this is what's happening in the the real world, in the outside world. We're increasing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. That makes plants grow faster. Okay, so this is increasing the seasonal amplitude of the CO2 cycle. Okay. So, um, so that's kind of the terrestrial carbon cycle. Um, now the next lecture will be on the ocean carbon cycle. Okay. But as we have not finished, because we've got time left, I'm going to start the next lecture because my lectures are a little bit out of balance. There's much more about the ocean than the carbon cycle in the land. But anyway, so we're going to go back a bit. But to summarise this lecture, okay, so CO2 has been going up, okay, and uh, it's been going up a, a lot faster than it has in the past, in the geological past, okay. Uh, the atmosphere um, is one of these boxes or reservoirs and there are big fluxes in and out of that box between the, between the atmosphere and the ocean and the atmosphere and the land. Okay? Okay. Um, it has a small residence time, which means its concentrations can take, change quite quickly, which is why we can see this annual cycle. Okay? Um, and yeah, so this, the land sink, okay? so the biosphere is critical in taking up our carbon dioxide. Okay? It's just as important as the ocean is soaking up the carbon dioxide. And if, if the, ca the carbon that we burnt just went into the atmosphere, we'd be in all kinds of trouble. And we are, we are in all, all kinds of trouble, but we're all kinds of more trouble. So if we 
So maintaining this land sink of carbon dioxide, this removal term into the terrestrial biosphere, keeping that is really important. Almost as important as reducing our own emissions. Okay? So don't eat burgers, although they are really tasty. Uh, they are responsible for the deforestation of kind of large bits of the rainforest. Also, you know, palm oil plantations, so all your food that has palm oil in, that's, you know, bad. Because that's removing the ability of the terrestrial biosphere to soak up this increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, so <clears throat> this is now the beginning of the next lecture. So, so we're going to be talking about the ocean, okay? And the ocean is really important because it's got a really huge amount of carbon stored in it, okay? Uh, and it interacts directly with the atmosphere through these two fluxes here. One flux in and one flux out. And we'll go on to what, how those fluxes work. But these fluxes are quite large. Okay? So they're almost as big as the uh, terrestrial photosynthesis cycle fluxes. Okay? So it's a huge store of carbon. And it's, got, it's quite well connected with the atmosphere. Okay? So if any of these, if we change the carbon dioxide concentration in the ocean it will force the atmosphere to follow. Okay? So actually, it's the concentration of the at in the atmosphere over long time periods, okay? and when I say long, I mean longer than the residence time of carbon in the atmosphere. Okay? Um, and you can kind of work, see that the, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere is 750. The fluxes in and out are you know, about 100 to 200. So the residence time of carbon in the atmosphere is only kind of a couple of years, maybe five or so years. So that means that on time scales longer than maybe five or ten years, it's actually the concentration of carbon in the ocean that determines what the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere is, which is also kind of a little bit counterintuitive because we're adding carbon to the ocean via the atmosphere. But this number and these fluxes are critical for determining what this is. Okay. So imagine if we suddenly doubled the concentration of carbon in the ocean overnight, which is impossible, but imagine that happened. That would really quickly start impacting the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. Okay? Whereas we, if, we, if, we, you know, if we doubled the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, it would take a really long time to change the concentration in the ocean. Okay? So we're going to be talking about some of these fluxes within the ocean now. So there's this flux in and out of the ocean, and the atmosphere quite obviously only interacts with the surface ocean because it's the bit that touches the atmosphere. Um, and then we have fluxes between the surface ocean and the deep ocean through mixing between the deep layer and the shallow layer. That's what's going on here. But we also have fluxes by organisms taking up carbon, okay? And then crazy stuff happens uh, which can force the carbon dioxide pressure up or down depending on what kind of organism it is. And we'll go over that tomorrow. Um, and then these little beasties, they die and sink down into the deep ocean, okay, where they release their carbon into the water again. So we're going to go through describing some of these boxes and some of these fluxes tomorrow. Um, so just, uh, just quickly, you know, it's not just carbon dioxide that's in the ocean. So we have this... Um, uh, this, this, the carbon in the ocean is well, we, mostly in this form called dissolved inorganic carbon, which isn't just this form bicarbonate, but it's mostly bicarbonate. It's also dissolved CO2, it's bicarbonate, and carbonate ions, and we'll go over tomorrow how they are proportioned. Um, and then a relatively small amount of the carbon in the ocean is this kind of biological carbon. So uh, bits of dead organic matter, bits of living organic matter, and big, big bits of kind of larger things, fire, 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 higher up the food chain. So these are small components of the carbon system in the ocean, yeah, small percentages, but they're really important because these, bottom four, they form particles, okay? Whereas these are dissolved ions, and particles sink, okay? So although it's a small percentage of the total carbon in the ocean, it's the only part of the carbon cycle which can move carbon downwards in the ocean. Okay? And if you move carbon downwards in the ocean, that's good because it stops it being in contact with the surface ocean and the atmosphere. 
So you can kind of like hide away carbon in the deep ocean so it can't interact with the atmosphere. Okay, so just quickly, um, I'm going to go over this, this concept, Henry's Law. So this is, this is the, the, the bit of physical chemistry that determines how much carbon, or how much of any gas, really, is in the gas phase. So think of this, this beaker as the Earth, and we've got an atmosphere and an ocean. Okay, so if you have a gas, some of that gas will be in the gas phase, kind of in the atmosphere, but some of that gas will dissolve in water. Okay? And this is, with CO2, this is exactly the same as like when you've got a can of fizzy pop, right? So some CO2 is dissolved in the fizzy pop, yeah? And some is in the headspace in, um, in the fizzy pop, right? Um, so the Henry's law is basically a law that says that at any one temperature, so at one temperature, the ratio of the concentration of the gas in the atmosphere and the concentration dissolved in the, in the, in the liquid is constant. Okay? So this is described by this equation here. So S is the solubility of the gas in the liquid. So you can think of that as the concentration of the gas in the liquid if the system was allowed to equilibrate. Okay? So this would be in maybe moles of gas per litre or grams of gas per litre, some amount of gas put dissolved per litre. Um, is proportional so by some constant times, it says the overlying pressure here, but this is the pressure of the gas. Okay, so it's not the total atmospheric pressure, it's the partial pressure of the gas, which can be think of as basically uh, if you took all of the other components out, if you made all of the other atmosphere go away and you just had, say for instance, the CO2 in the atmosphere, if that was all that was left, we'd have much lower pressure yeah, if we took all of the air out of the room and just had CO2, okay, pressure would go down. So you can think of the partial pressure as the, the total atmospheric pressure times the concentration. So uh, in the terms of CO2, CO2 is about 400 parts per million. So it would be one atmosphere times 400 divided by a million. Okay? So it would be quite low. So the solubility would then be um, determined by the thing. Okay? So the solubility constant determines basically how much of the, the gaseous species is dissolved in the gas and how much is in the, in the um, atmosphere above. Okay? So these are some examples. So CO2 um, at one atmosphere, you can, you can dissolve one and a half grams of CO2 in one litre of water. Now, CO2 is kind of quite soluble, okay, compared to a gas like nitrogen, and that's because CO2 is a polar molecule, okay, so it's got two oxygens out the end and some spare electrons hanging up above its head, so it can interact with the hydrogen bonds in water and kind of dissolve in it, whereas something like nitrogen, which is a non-polar molecule, that finds it much harder to dissolve. So the ratio of CO2 dissolved in the water compared to the ratio of nitrogen dissolved in the water is higher. So that is one of the reasons why we can store lots of CO2 in the ocean, because it's a soluble gas. Okay, um, there are other reasons why we can store lots of CO2 in the water, and we'll come on to those tomorrow. But also importantly, that solubility constant, okay, so the amount you can dissolve per litre of water, is not constant, counterintuitively. Okay, so at, turns out that the higher the temperature is, Okay, the lower the solubility constant. Okay, whereas at low temperatures you can dissolve more gas in the water. Okay, so think about if you leave your can of fizzy pop on a radiator, it stops being fizzy. Okay, because as it warms up, the gas dissolves out of the, the fizzy pop. Okay, whereas if you take your fizzy pop and put it in the fridge, it stays fizzier for longer. <coughs> okay, so lower temperatures you can dissolve more gas in the water. Okay? So that's really important for determining this is kind of a feedback on climate. Okay? So the warmer the climate gets, okay, the warmer the ocean gets. Okay? And if you make the ocean warmer, that means you can dissolve less CO2 in the ocean, which means proportionally more must be in the atmosphere. So that leads to a positive feedback 
So this is called the solubility feedback on climate, um, uh, which is important because this responds quite quickly because the, this basically um, responds instantaneously to a temperature change. Okay, so okay, so this is this is basically this flux here, the flux in and also the flux out is determined by the solubility constant. Okay, and it's really strongly temperature dependent. Okay, so I think we'll finish there for today, and tomorrow we'll catch up. We'll we'll, we'll do more on the uh, um, this have the ocean carbon cycle, and tomorrow there will be an experiment, and it's very exciting. So come along.